What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with basically Kane the Conqueror. Now this is a story called Timeless. This is a one shot and this is amazing because Kane the Conqueror is going to fight Dr. Doom and it's one of the coolest things ever. All right, so check this out. So this story is written from the perspective of a guy named Anatoly Petrov and this guy is basically in the present day because we're going to actually have some multiversal hijinks, not really traditional time travel hijinks, we will to a degree, but what this guy's doing is literally chronicling the stories of different villains who have existed across the world and what he ends up saying here or the way he kind of lines it out is that going pound for pound looking at accomplishment versus accomplishment that the greatest threat the earth has ever faced when it came to various villains was actually Dr. Doom, that it was Dr. Doom who was the greatest threat, no matter where you go. Now, this actually lines up really, really well with the story that we're covering over on Thursdays, which should come out tomorrow, which is Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four, where even he establishes that Dr. Doom in every universe is the greatest threat that universe is ever going to face because his desire for power is limitless and he will capture incredibly high levels of power, right? His thirst is just unquenchable. And so ultimately, Kang ends up visiting Dr. Petrov. Now, some of this is just sort of Kang being petty, but right? he wants to prove that he's actually better than Dr. Doom, which is pretty straightforward. But it's one of those things. It's one of those uh, interesting kind of situations because Petrov asks him, like, are you here to kill me? And the response of Kang is no, right? I'm here to show you or to do what nobody else can do. I'm here to change your mind, right? I'm here to get you to see me differently than the way that you've seen me based on my different hijinks and so on. Now, that's an important distinction to understand. And the reason why is because when it comes to someone like Dr. Doom, he's in Latveria, right? So he's literally right over there. You can just go see him over there if you were foolish enough to do so. With Kang the Conqueror, he exists in the future of the 31st century, which unless you're the Fantastic Four or you're some person or group of people out there with the ability to time travel, you don't really know Kang. All you know is Kang when he appears and does some things. Now, an argument could be made if he wanted to be seen as more than what he was, then he should have just not been a dick every time he showed up. But still, like that's that's kind of the argument that's being created here, right? And so this guy being able to actually travel along with Kang the Conqueror in his various conquests and whatnot basically gives him a much better understanding of who Kang is about. And so what this does is it actually has him, has Kang bringing Petrov back to the early days of humanity where he ends up fighting this just gigantic woolly mammoth. Now, the funny thing about this, and this is one of the cool things, when it comes to Kang, he is arguably one of the more powerful members in Marvel Comics. In terms of what he can just do on his own, which is to say his fighting style or his powers, he's not really much of a challenge to anybody. What makes Kang so dangerous is his ability to manipulate time. He can just go back in time and prevent you from being born. And so in the face of the fact that a guy can prevent your existence from happening, Again, he kind of falls in that threshold of being one of the more powerful characters, more or less because of what his technology allows him to do, and less so what he's physically capable of doing. But even then, when it comes to Kang, despite all that vaunted ability, what he prefers to do is challenge himself on the personal level. And that's why in facing off against this woolly mammoth, he literally just casts aside all his technology, all of his arms, all of his armament, and then decides to fight this thing with nothing but a knife. Now, this is designed to show Dr. Petrov what Kang's capable of, in one-on-one -on -one conflict, which admittedly is actually something Dr. Doom can't do. A lot of you guys don't know that. Dr. Doom is not an accomplished fighter. Dr. Doom is a guy who uses magic and mysticism, but when it comes to just full-on, one-to-one, man-to-man, bare-knuckle fighting, Dr. Doom doesn't really have it, right? Like, it's just not necessarily there. Every time he faced off against the Incredible Hulk or overpowered the Incredible Hulk or something like that, it was one of those things where it was largely relegated to him using some sort of magic or mysticism in order to subscribe to this YouTube channel, which is what you should be doing right now. Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button, but in all seriousness, in order to achieve his goal. And so once this battle is done, right, once this conflict is over, and of course you have Kang who's basically up on top and he's the guy who's kind of, you know, the, the winner, so to speak, that what he ends up doing is taking Dr. Petrov back to his vessel. And then suddenly they end up getting a chronal anomaly detection. Basically it's like an earthquake, right? Something in the timeline is being disrupted. Now, this is one of the things that Kang is always 
aware of, right? If scientists always have these kind of seismographs around the world in order to determine when an earthquake is happening, then Kang has those all across the time stream to know when someone's traveling back and forth through time. Now, sometimes he'll do nothing. It just doesn't matter. Other times he'll teleport there and he'll just watch and he'll see how things unfold. And then there's times when he'll actually step in and intervene. This is one of those times when he steps in and intervenes. Now, the cool thing about this is that the way that Kang describes it is that it's basically a time quake, right? That something is exerting extreme chronal gravity upon our timeline. So here's something that I want you guys to be aware of, right? Anytime you've ever watched a, a science film and there's something like the moon that crashes into Earth during that garbage ass movie Moonfall, or when you had like uh, Melancholia, which is actually a phenomenal movie, and you basically have some giant celestial body that crashes into Earth, it doesn't work that way. What you actually have is something called the Roche limit. So quite literally, if a planet twice the size of Earth got close enough, the gravity of that planet would actually start tearing chunks of the Earth apart until eventually the two crashed into each other, but it would be that celestial body crashing into what remains of like a third of the earth or something along those lines. That's basically what's happening here, that this alternate reality is moving closer and closer to the main Marvel universe. And as it does, it's quite literally enacting the Roche limit, which is pulling the timeline apart. Now it's starting as kind of things on the fringes of the universe itself, just way, way out there where no one's going to notice, like an army that's creeping up from 200 miles away, but eventually it'll get close enough to where everybody will notice. And then when it reaches that point, it will simply be too late. And so what ends up happening is Kang brings Dr. Petrov with him and they teleport to this universe, right? They teleport to this reality. Now, one of the cool things that goes on here is this story does take place before a lot of the things that we've read so far, Avengers versus X-Men versus Eternals and so on and so forth. But one of the other things that it does is it continues to tease the upcoming Thanos story. Now, for those of you guys who aren't familiar with that, the upcoming Thanos story is a story where Thanos gets the Infinity Stones, attaches them to the hammer of Mjolnir that belongs to Thor, which Thanos is wielding. He's also got the arm of the Destroyer armor, and he's leading an army of the dead. God only knows what in the hell happened to get to that point, but we will find out, and I am excited. So here's the thing. The way that Kang describes this alternate reality is a pirate timeline, and the reality here is that it's not supposed to be here. So what he ends up doing doing is actually giving Dr. Petrov this bit of an explanation about the nature of Immortus. So for those of you guys who are familiar with Marvel Comics, bear with me here because I'm sure we're going to have people who don't know anything about Kang or Immortus or whatever. So I'm going to explain that to them here. So for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with this and to, to explain this in ridiculously simplified terms, Immortus is the end result of Kang, and it follows a linear progression, right? So in the 31st century, Nathaniel Richards, supposedly the descendant of Dr. Doom, ends up discovering he can travel through time. The first thing he does is he goes back to his younger self and he tells him, these are the decisions you need to make so that you become me, basically Kang the Conqueror. His younger self chooses to rebel, he becomes Iron Lad. The next thing Kang the Conqueror does is he travels to the distant past on Earth in Egypt, and he tries to conquer the world in ancient Egypt. He calls himself Ramatut. He's defeated by the Fantastic Four. He's supposed to go back to the 31st century, but instead he discovers true limbo, which is a place that exists outside of space and time. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you refer to that place as the Quantum Realm. Inside of Limbo, Kang realizes that he's part of the bigger multiverse as a whole, but also the multiverse has a very delicate balance. And so what he ends up doing is basically striking a deal with the Timekeepers in that as Immortus, which is what he calls himself now, that he will basically prune the timeline Line of any alternate realities that are decaying or dying or aren't supposed to be there, whatever the case happens to be, using whatever rhyme or reason makes sense to Marvel Comics at the time. It's literally just that. There's really nothing more to it than that. And so every time you pick up a Marvel comic and you see Kang the Conqueror, like in this story, this is taking place between the time when Nathaniel Richards discovered time travel in the 31st century, but before he traveled to Limbo and became Immortus. That's basically when these things are taking place. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's get back into it. So here's the thing. Once this is kind of discussed, the idea behind it is that this timeline was supposed to have been destroyed. This timeline was supposed to have just kind of been set adrift. And so what Immortus would do is much like a dead flower or a dead leaf on a tree, he would prune it, meaning he would clip the branch. And when that happened, it would basically just drift off into the ether. It's supposed to effectively just disappear, right? Just kind of go into what is the black hole of existence. But some 
something happened in this universe where it didn't. Instead of quote unquote falling to the ground and dying, it actually started to pull itself back to the tree, or in this instance, the main timeline. Something is doing that. And so that's what Kang and Dr. Petrov are going to investigate. Now, once they get there, the first thing they see, and this is what's so crazy about this, the first thing they end up seeing are all these dead celestials, right? Like all these dead celestials everywhere. And in fact, the Sword of Damocles, which was at one point the base of Cain the Conqueror, presumably in this alternate reality, that's destroyed as well. But whatever this being is, or whoever this person is, is able to destroy cosmic entities, literally crush them and defeat them, which is no small feat. That's colossal, right? But this also indicates this person can basically control the fundamental forces of reality because it looks like it was a hand-to-hand -hand fight where these guys were killed. And so as you end up having Kang and Dr. Petrov who enter into the Sword of Damocles and make their way throughout this entire citadel, they ultimately end up coming across Dr. Doom. Now, this is the crazy thing here, right? Like this is, this is the crazy thing. It's not just Dr. Doom right? Like it's, he's like, he's like, I have come Victor. It's not just Dr. Doom. Instead, it's actually this Dr. Doom who references not just Kang, but a Kang. So what this seems to indicate is more than one Kang the Conqueror has traveled to this place and tried to destroy this guy. Because remember, every universe in the multiverse has its own version of Kang the Conqueror. So different versions of Kang have discovered that this universe is trying to get back to the multiverse and is tearing apart timelines on its journey. And so they've come here trying to defeat Dr. Doom and were probably destroyed in, in return. And that's that. Either that or he just destroyed his own universe as Kang and this is like the second one he's met. I don't know. But regardless of the situation, what we end up finding out here is that once this version of Dr. Doom removes his helmet, that it's not actually Victor Von Doom. This guy, is Reed Richards, that what he had done is that in this alternate universe, when it had basically been plucked from the timeline, that null time, or basically the destruction of the universe itself had started to creep in, right? Literally, the universe started falling apart at the seams. The different superheroes banded together, and the different superheroes were able to stave off their own destruction. The problem with this is that all it did was basically slow things down. There was no way to stop the destruction of this universe as time went on because of the fact that it's just kind of existing out there and is going to be eaten or, or kind of consumed or destroyed. Not really by like a physical being out there. It's simply just, it's, it's you existing out in the desert for like, you know, 60 days with no water, right? You're going to die long before you reach those 60 days. You'll die of dehydration. And that's literally what this, what, what happened with this universe. And so what ended up going on here is this version of Reed literally says the world was still sick, right? Still dying. The entropic death of our timeline was still occurring just an inch at a time the world lost hope do you know what happens to a society without hope king total collapse and he says i never lost hope not for the world the trade-off is that i threw away any hope for myself i would do anything to save the world so i replaced my eyes with the time and reality stones and forced my will upon the timeline i killed celestials and drank their blood to take their power for myself i destroyed anyone who raised a hand raised even their voice against me and my mission my mission to save this timeline so quite literally what reed richards in this alternate reality did is he killed dr doom he took his place he took the time and the reality stones now he basically has the ability to control all of time and space then he killed the celestials and consumed their power and so it's basically one of the most powerful versions of dr doom that we've ever seen in marvel comics the only two versions i would say that are more powerful than this one is the version of dr doom that got the full-on infinity gauntlet in an alternate reality story and the version of dr doom that basically took the power of the beyonder in the original secret wars from 1984 a playlist that you will find down in the description which you are welcome to check out after you're done with this video but the thing about this is that as time progresses right as this kind of conversation goes on you end up basically having kane the conqueror launching his attacks against dr doom as best he can but the funny thing about this is that at the end of the day none of it really seems to work and the reason why is because with dr doom controlling all of time and space and with them being in an alternate reality, 
fighting. What Kang had done is he had brought all of his arms and armament with him. He would brought all of his weapons with him. And he basically just kind of stored them just slightly out of phase with the existing universe, right? So basically like a second ahead. So he can just kind of reach and grab those and then come back. Because remember, with somebody like Kang who time travels, for you and me, it might look like teleportation. For, for Kang the Conqueror, he teleported away at five minutes to and, and traveled 10,000 years into the future. And then when he came back, it was five minutes and one second, right? That's how it would look. That's how it would be for Kang. That's what it's like when you can basically control time. So again, it's a pretty badass moment. But the reality here is realizing what Kang's doing. And because he controls time and reality, what Reed ends up doing is actually teleporting all of Kang's weapons to its location and then basically destroying all the weapons of Kang save for his own sword. And so again, it's kind of hearkening back to the beginning of the story where Kang was facing off against this giant woolly mammoth monster using nothing but a knife. But something that I want you guys to notice here is that in this fight, against Doom, where Kang is just hopelessly outmatched, to be quite honest with you guys, where he simply just cannot be destroyed by Kang because he's just way more powerful in terms of all the energy that he has. Anatoly starts to see Kang the Conqueror in a way that he just hadn't really seen before. And a lot of this is the writer Jed McKay kind of really giving us this change in perspective of Kang in the sense that when you look at things like the Fantastic Four, where he shows up and faces off against them, or in Young Avengers, or even the Avengers comics themselves, most appearances of Kang the Conqueror are just him as some kind of a demigod, right? Just some kind of an astronomical being who's just doing crazy things and manipulating time and trying to find some way to conquer the world. Depending on what story you're reading, he feels like a villain of the week. But something that's going on here, and it's not even just Jed McKay doing this, it's Marvel in general. They're doing a lot more of these kind of deep dives into the nature of King, as opposed to him just being a guy who fights the Avengers, manipulates time, assumes or assembles a giant, you know, council of himself, that there's a lot more to him than that. And so where where people have looked at Kang and they've seen him as almost a godlike entity, this man that manipulates and controls time, that for Kang himself, Nathaniel doesn't see himself that way. He doesn't see himself as some kind of a godly being who's beyond reproach or anything like that. And in fact, he's actually relishing this conflict. He's loving the idea that in this fight against Dr. Doom, that he could be killed, that he could be destroyed by this guy. He just loves this opportunity and he's just kind of living for this moment. But at the end of the day, one of the cool things he points out and really just kind of gets into the mind of Reed is he taunts him with the idea that he was always going to be a tyrant. Now, this is an indication of how well Kang the Conqueror knows Reed Richards versus how well he knows Victor Von Doom, right? Reed Richards being Mr. Fantastic, the leader of the Fantastic Four. He's always calm, he's always composed. But when we look at stories like Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four, Reed Richards forming the Council of Reeds and then screwing things up. When we look at things like Civil War, or we look at the formation of the Illuminati, or even when you go into Jonathan Hickman's Avengers, the new Avengers run, and Reed has to come to the realization that he can't save the multiverse, and that seemingly this kind of falls on his shoulders, at least from his perspective, it's very easy for him to be emotionally manipulated. Mentally, not so much, because for the most part, Reed's just too smart for that. But toying with his emotions, getting him to think out of being logical and more emotional, that's not difficult for Kang to do. It's difficult for most anybody else to do, but it's not difficult for Kang because he knows the life and times of Reed. The thing about this is that as these guys are talking and as they're progressing and sort of doing their thing, that what happens is that in that moment when literally Reed is about to kill Kang, that Anatoly kind of shows up out of nowhere, steals one of the weapons that belongs to Reed himself, the one that he used to basically kill most everybody there, and then kills Reed with his own spear. And so in that moment, there's this kind of conversation that happens between the two of them. Because the funny thing about this is that Kang responds and says, you would aid the conqueror in single combat. You understand what this means, do you not? And the response of Anatoly is, I know, I know that you'll kill me for it. And so Kang responds and says, then why? Why? Why would you do such a thing? Court the death you know I must dispense. And the response of Anatoly here is incredibly inf insightful, right? He says, if Doom Richards killed you, I would be dead anyway, and my timeline would be at risk. You believe to be the pinnacle of humanity. You must be greater than all others. You must put yourself before all others. But I believe that true human greatness lies in putting others before yourself. And so Kang kind of overhears this, 
and then just sort of laughs at him, right? And then walks away, right? Of course, he ends up bringing Anatoly back. But one of the things he says is he says, come on, I believe our time together is finished. I will return you to shortly after we left your office. And the response here where Anatoly's kind of like, okay, this is strange. Like, I thought my death was impending. Kang actually responds in a really interesting way. He says, this is still my victory. I brought you with me as another of my weapons, Petrov. Richards, Doom, the one thing you can count on from them is their arrogance. This was all to plan, but you, of course, don't know that. This is the very reason I take on traveling companions, Petrov. I like being challenged. You stood up to me, knowing that I would most likely kill you. That is the kind of courage I have always admired in humanity. That is the element that makes our species worthy. That is what humanity possesses that has allowed it to produce King. And that's the cool thing, right? That's the interesting thing about Nathaniel Richards. Again, when you look at Kang from a different perspective, it's kind of hard to see him as a guy where he's more than just some dude who jumps back and forth through time and causes problems. But in this moment here right now, as he's talking to Anatoly, it's like, I can respect those who would look in the face of death and laugh, who would even challenge those who are greater than them. To me, there is nothing better among humanity than a person who looks to, to basically become better than who they are. That's how I got to where I am, and that's what makes humanity great. Most people will never do that. 99% of people will fall rank and file, and they'll live the life they live because that's just what you're supposed to do. They'll never think outside the box. But for those who do, they go on to become great people and do great things. You're one of those people, Petrov. Also, just be aware, if you write your book and you talk about how Doom's the greatest villain of all time and not me, I'm going to come back and kill you. So just put my name in there instead of Doom, <laughs> which is really Kang in his most true form. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Thank you all for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.